Well, Dr. Allen, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Arlena, for having me as your guest. I'm excited <laughs> about being here. I'm excited too, because I don't even know. I was looking at uh, Amazon, looking at books, because I'm an obsessive reader. And um, somehow I came across your book title. Um, I think it was the Emotional Sobriety one. Yeah, uh, 12, 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety, my new book. Yeah, Getting Your Recovery Unstuck. And as someone in long-term recovery, I've been sober for 28 years. There have been times over that span where I felt stuck, whether it was like being uninspired or feeling like, gosh, it's the same, like you go to meetings, it's the same thing over and over. And so there do, there are sort of like these emotional plateaus. So I would love to hear about how, what do they, what are these, what are these stuck places feel like? How do we identify them? What are some of the tools to get past them? Um, I also want to talk about, <laughs> we were just talking about your first book as well that did really well, 12 Stupid Things That Mess Up My Recovery. We have to get into that. <laughs> That'll be really good. And of course, we'll talk about the podcast and and all the things. But um, before we jump in, I like to do a little game called The Lightning Room. Okay. Which I, which I, I know it's always very slow. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> so I love books. So when you think back to the beginning of your recovery, uh, was there any books that really helped you? Well, the 12 and 12, I found to be very helpful. I mean, yeah. you know, when I was, I, I love the big book. I think there's a lot of great information, but the 12 and 12 really gave me kind of a more in-depth view on the steps. And I was very fortunate to have a sponsor that says, look, at Alan, the program is about learning how to apply these steps into your daily life. And so he really encouraged me to attend step study meetings to make that a real part, an integral part of my recovery. And so going through the 12 and 12 in those meetings was just very important in the first year. It really gave me a sense of the experience people, you know, were having as they were working the steps. And that became, you know, the foundation for my recovery. I love the 12 and 12. I actually do a women's uh, 12 and 12 study every Saturday and it never gets old. You know, I, every time in, in right now, you know, I, I've, I started when COVID hit um to to be to, to to be part to give something back right to be part of a for my role in service right i started a an emotional sobriety workshop on thursday nights and it's at 7 p.m pacific standard time i'll send you all the link you can post it oh, later you. on but what we're doing now so we've gone through the steps and looked at how the steps help us achieve a practice of emotional sobriety now we're going through the steps and looking at them from the lens of how do they help us develop an authentic self-esteem mm. and how does that authentic self-esteem help us with our emotional sobriety? It's been a fascinating thing. And so we're, we're using the 12 and 12, right? is going in and talking about things to, to stimulate our discussion. I do it with Herb Kagan, who's, you know, done some phenomenal work on the West Coast in terms of 12-step workshops, year-long workshops. Two other therapists, Roger Andes and Tom Rutledge, they're just wonderful. So we all take turns leading the discussion of that particular step. So right now we're on step number six. Ah, and so this week, Tom, this week, Roger's going to go last week, Herb went, then it'll be Tom. And then the last week I, I take, I'm the cleanup hitter. <laughs> I go number fourth in the rotation on this stuff, but it's, I, I, in, in, I'm saying this because I'm going through the 12 and 12 again, I'm yeah. underlining new things I know, that I haven't I know. underlined before. It's like other things pop out. And I think that that's part of who we are as people, right? What's What's ever current is going to be more relevant when I, in terms of what I'm reading, the issues I'm struggling with, what I'm learning and stuff like that. So I love the 12. So that would be my book, the 12 and 12. I love it. I love it. I, and it's so funny. I've heard people say, oh, it feels like the, the books change as you, <laughs> people swear they've been rewritten, but you're right. It's like every time we address the steps, we actually change. And so the next time we review the same information, we get something different out of it because we're different. That's right on. That's a great way to see it, right? Because yeah. 
I'm looking at it from a very different perspective mm -hmm. as I do the work, right? When I read that 12 and 12 back. So, you know, I'm, I've celebrated now 51 years in recovery. <laughs> That's I, so crazy. So crazy. Oh, you were so young when you got I was so young. It was back in 1971 that I came in the program. And so when I read it at that point, of course, when I read it today, you know, after getting all this education in psychology and after 50 years of counseling people and doing therapy and my own personal work in therapy and with my sponsor, now when I read it, it's like the texture is different. The yeah. depth is different. I mean, it it resonates so deeply inside of my being that it's it's exciting. I'm I'm so excited. And that's the thing I want people to hear yeah. is what's great about recovery is that it stimulates our curiosity and we become interested in ourselves or let me own it i became interested in myself in a very different way than i ever was before it was like i was in this trance and i was just going through life doing what i was doing you know, following this path that I was on, there wasn't a lot of consciousness to it. There wasn't a lot of reflection to it, contemplation. And then recovery comes along and I wake up. And as I start to wake up, I start to get curious about myself. And I'm telling you, after 51 years, that curiosity is at an all time high. I mean, and that's, that's the wonderful gift of recovery is that I'm more excited about this today than I was 51 years ago. And I was really excited then. <laughs> you can tell I'm a guy that gets excited about stuff. But, <laughs> but I, I love, I love the process of recovery. I think it's amazing. I do too. I mean, I, I feel like I'm so committed to the idea that the 12 steps are such um, a worthy endeavor. And I, I got some backlash recently. Somebody sent me this book. It was debunking the science behind debunking the myths behind 12 steps. And I was like, there is no science. You can't get empirical data from an anonymous program. So it's just people, I want to, I'll ask you about that later, but I just find people are so passionate, like for and against, right. Yes. And I find that the people who are against are their, um, their ideas are their ideas are riddled with misunderstandings and lacking in context and perspective. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about that a little bit. Later. Well, you know, it's such an important thing. Just let me just say one thing about that mm -hmm. because something that's that I've confronted a lot. You know, wearing two hats, being a clinical psychologist, right, and dealing with a lot of mental health professionals. And to me, there's a lot of ignorance in the mental health profession about twelve step program. You'll hear things like it's a cop out. We're not taking responsibility for ourselves. When it's a say, cult it's a disease, right? A when little you, bit. When you say it's a disease, you're copying out. When you say you're powerless. Yeah. And, you know, and as a clinical psychologist, one of the things, one of the talks I give is the therapeutic value of the steps. Yeah. The steps are grounded in very solid psychological uh, concepts and constructs and ideas it's they're not hokey things it's not like there's some black magic going on at meetings or or white magic or whatever you want to call it but what's happening here if you look at it it follows the arc of good therapy mm -hmm. it's the same thing that happens that you you first of all you take responsibility for yourself that any good therapist is going to encourage you to do that you start to examine yourself and understand yourself more. I call it, you raise your awareness and now you integrate that. See, the wonderful thing about AA is it takes behaviorism and psychodynamics and puts it together so that we not only understand ourselves, but we change our behavior. There it is. That's the change in behavior. Yeah. It's change amazing. the way we think. And yeah. Right. Listen, there's some, yeah, maybe we should just get into it. I mean, it drives me crazy when I see people who they look at the steps, they, without, they, they rely on their own uninformed interpretation of what it means. And it's like, why not talk to somebody who actually has experience with the meaning 
of these things instead of relying. I mean, that's contempt prior to investigation. It's like, if you're going to claim good science, that would require you to do the deep dive investigation. And it makes me crazy when people, and I wonder, I wonder what you would think about what is it that really gets people riled up about it? Is it the God thing? Is it, and, and let's be clear, it's powerlessness over alcohol, not everything. Like you have to invoke your power of choice to set aside your ego, to set aside your limiting beliefs, or even examine your limiting beliefs. It's like, that's a choice. That is your power to do that. Right. So it is a hundred percent about taking responsibility and then asking for help, which really means looking outside of yourself for some information so that it might offer you context and perspective so that it makes sense to make different choices. So I, I was trained as the Gestalt therapist, right? So one of the principles of Gestalt therapy is what we call the paradoxical theory of change. So if I'm going to change, I have to own what I am doing rather than try to be someone I'm not. So as soon as I say I'm powerless, now I begin the process of change. By owning my truth, which is my powerlessness, and look, I was powerless over alcohol. I tried everything in the world to control that. It yeah. can, I was out of control. I was powerless. When I own that, I became now open to finding and discovering a power. Yeah. But, but let's be clear. Let's be clear, though, because people get stuck on the idea of powerless. But we're talking about powerlessness over alcohol. Right. Right. And and I would argue that everybody is powerless over alcohol in the sense that the purpose of ingesting alcohol is that it changes the, changes the way you feel. And that is true for everybody. That's the reason people drink is you ingest alcohol. It's water soluble. It's fat soluble. It like it permeates every cell in your body. It, it has a predictable outcome you take it it affects your your mind and, and that affects everybody it's but not this, like you can ingest alcohol and then will yourself to not feel right. the effects so everyone right. is powerless. powerless over it. but here's what i mean about the paradoxical theory of change okay we admit it we were powerless so let's say you're dishonest until you admit you're dishonest you can't get honest <laughs> if if you are if you're rigid, until you face your rigidity, you can't become flexible. <laughs> until you face that you're emotionally dependent, you can't become autonomous. See, this first requirement we had, we admit it, we were powerless. We're learning something about the process of change. We're applying it to alcohol because that's, that's what's most immediate to us in our life when we come in the program right? Because our life is a mess, right? We totally, it's, it's, I was. Rome is on fire. Rome is burning, right? That's the thing. So we have to start there. But what we're learning is that if I want to change something, I need to admit what's going on with me. I can't jump over that and say, well, I, I'm, um, I'm rigid, so I'm just going to be flexible from now on. It doesn't work that way. You have to understand your rigidity and take complete responsibility yeah. and understand what made you rigid. See, I have to understand what made me powerless. Like you said, part of it, I just need to look at what happens to me when I ingest alcohol. That's mm -hmm. powerless. I also need to look at that there's some other process that goes on that's for some reason I can't stop after a couple of drinks. Not every time, but it's unpredictable when I can and when I can't. See, that's the other thing. I, I used to go to a party and say, hey, tonight's one of those nights. I think I'll just have two drinks. You know, five hours later, I have drink a 12 pack of, of old style. <laughs> I've had a blackout and I'm laying on the front porch of my home because I can't open the door. I mean, that was not intended. That right. control is what happened to me when I drank. But this idea that we admit we have to own what we're doing to make a change is solid psychology. 
Yeah. See, that's what I was saying about if they want, yeah. if people want to argue this, there's no, there's a lot of science. Any therapist is going to tell you, you can't change something you're not taking responsibility for. Exactly. You can't do it. Yeah. Do you feel, do you think that maybe, okay, I've been stuck on this thing and maybe you can help me sort this out. Um, there are these, I had a guy reach out to me. He wanted to be on the podcast because he wrote a book about how to beat alcohol using this step down process, but he disclosed he was still drinking. So I was like, uh, no, but in my mind, I was like, he was like, there needs to be a program for people who, you know, don't believe in religion or the power he was stuck on the powerless thing. I mean, he had, had like this laundry list of like limiting beliefs. And, but what I saw was this extreme independence. And it's, it, to me, that's like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, isn't that a trauma response from childhood when you're just left alone to have all these unresolved feelings, you learn, you can't trust people. So that's it, this extreme independence. I want to do it on my own. Right. And it, it didn't right. work for him anyway. That those people don't ask is what makes alcohol that important that you have to try to find a way to control it? What right. makes it so important? I mean, come on. Now, if we were talking about green beans, you you would see how absurd this is. Well, you know, I'm, I'm doing eight cans of green beans a day. And so I want to develop a program when I only am eating one can every other day. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, why are green beans that important to you that you have that first of all that you're eating eight cans and that now you want to get to one can? See, it's we don't see the obvious sometimes is that no. is that we make it so important like we have to have this. And see, that's the great thing that I learned is that look, my drinking, what I realized today is that it created an emotional freedom in me that I could not create myself. Mm -hmm. I was so lost in all of these rules about how I was supposed to be, how I was supposed to feel. I didn't know what to do with the grief. I lost my father when I was 11. I did not know how to handle that, that depth of pain and loss that I had at that point in time. And nobody in my, everybody in my family was, it's like the minute he died, we all went into our own corners of the house. You know, there we lost not only did I lose my dad, I lost my mom, I lost my grandfather, I lost my connection with my sibs, I lost my connection to myself. I didn't know what to do with all of those feelings. I didn't know how to deal with that. But when I drank, it didn't matter. Now, I was okay being Alan for a very temporary period of time, because once the effects of the alcohol wore off, then I'm back to having all these, these feelings about myself that I didn't know how to cope with it. And I know for me that when the first drink I had, I tell everybody this, that, that I, I don't know if I was born an alcoholic or not, but the first drink I had, an alcoholic was born. Because How it, old were you? I was 12 years old when I had my first oh, drink. Okay. I was a teenage alcoholic. I was having blackouts in, in at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I dropped out of high school at 16 years old because it was interfering with my drinking. Of course, the most important thing every day was finding out whose parents were gone, who had some liquor in their cabinets and getting over to the house and drinking their liquor and putting water back in the bottle, right? Those I may have done that. <laughs> I, I could see the <laughs> smile on your face. I know yeah. you did. Yeah, about but, 14 years old. But yeah. That was it for me. So when I look back at that, I can see the function it played in my life. And that's yeah. the way I think about it. You know, we talk about character defects. I, I think of character defects as adaptations. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're adaptations. Somebody in the Thursday night meeting, um, he said they're character defaults. I like that. Mm. Instead of defects. We're default. Yeah a way of coping with a situation that we learned very early on in our life yeah and so even so i don't look at these things as though they're they say that something's wrong with us these things were the best response that we could come up with at the time that we developed them and even if we get stuck in recovery like we were talking about in the beginning, everybody's going to get stuck in recovery doesn't mean your recovery something's wrong with your recovery I would challenge anybody that says that if you're stuck in your recovery, something's wrong. No, doesn't mean you have to go to more meetings. It doesn't mean you have to, you might, I mean, it might be helpful to do that, 
But what it means is, is that when you're stuck, it's a very important, there's an emerging opportunity to understand what's creating that so you could take the next step in your development. And that's how we work. We like as a kid, you crawled until you were ready to start walking. You pulled yourself up on the table. You let go. And what did you do? You fell. You were stuck at the crawling stage. But what did you do? Because you didn't have in your head, you should be different than you are. You got back up. You let go of the table again. And you learned how to balance. And then you took a step and fell. And then what did you do? Pulled yourself back up. And you kept doing that. And how many times did you fall? As many as you needed to. But you didn't have a rule in your head. There's something wrong with me that I'm falling. My God, I've done this five times. I should have it mastered by now. If we had that, we'd all still be crawling. Yeah, that, that's a very common reoccurring theme is I should be different. That's it. When that's I hit 20 years sober, my predominant feeling was shame. I was like, why am I not better than this? It was so weird, totally unexpected. I thought I was going to feel like a million bucks. Yeah, but see but these rules, unconscious rules unconscious. show up in our life. And see, that's why I mean, that doesn't mean something was wrong with you. It was like, wow, that had to surface for you to get a hold of that yeah. and start to work with it to get free from it. What I'm hearing from you is this, you look at things through this lens of compassion right? Like you're bringing so much compassion to each one of these phases. And like, it's okay. It's normal. It's not a character defect. It's an adaptation. I had a lady tell me once that they were human frailties and that we all have them. And that sounded so compassionate to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, this process of changing and grow, it's really growing, right? Growing pains. Yeah, we, right. we find we reach these plateaus and then it's maybe just time to go a little bit deeper. Yeah, that's right. You know, I say to people all the time that it's not what's wrong with us. That's the problem. It's what's right about us that we're not honoring. Oh, that's so good. And see, is when we don't honor what's right about me, I I need to continue to grow to be OK. Mm -hmm. If I stop that process, I'm going to get unhappy with myself. Yeah. The unhappiness is not the problem. The problem is I'm not honoring my need to continue to grow. Yeah, complacency is kind of a funny thing. It's we have this need for comfort and safety, which seems normal and natural, but it does, it will bite you in the ass at some point. <laughs> well, if you're stuck in it, see, there is that, yeah. like you said, stuck. there's nothing wrong with stepping back, enjoying some of the progress and the gains yeah. and enjoying it. But then it's, it's like the tide coming in and out. Then there's now time to push myself, to expand my boundaries, to continue to learn, be uncomfortable. Like you said, I'm not, there's going to be no growth unless I confront some things that I am uncomfortable with looking at. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons we didn't get into this, but we'll talk about it in a little bit. But one of the reasons why Bill Wilson when he wrote this letter in 1953 that became published in the 1958 grapevine, he said in the beginning of his letter that he hoped that the next major development in Alcoholics Anonymous would be emotional sobriety. Mm. It really was his vision back then that it would be, and it didn't happen. And I think what we're talking about right now is one of the reasons is I think people got settled into good enough this is good enough. And they didn't yeah. push it. I'm not drinking today. That's good enough. Nothing. It's important not to be drinking. You can't do this other work that we're talking about if you are drinking, because it really, it takes all hands on deck or all the different parts of you to be, to be clear headed enough and, and, and be able to look at these things and to be able to face them. But I think that's what happened is see that, that we settled for certain things, emotional sobriety, it has nothing to do with settling. It has to do with letting the best in you run the rest of you. That's the way I say it all the time. Letting the best in you run the rest of you. And that the best in me is the part of me that wants to continue to grow, wants to continue to be what I can be, wants to learn how to be in relationship with you. The way I heard, I heard it's somebody say it, 
It's to learn how to act for ourselves without being selfish and how to act for others without being selfless. Oh, that's good. Act for self without being self. This is what emotional sobriety is. Act for others. It's the balance. It's the balance between the we, our togetherness, our connection, and the I, my separateness, my individuality. And when I'm operating in the best in me, I'm striving to keep this balanced. You are as important as me, not less than or, or, or more. So I try to strive to keep the connection and to keep connected to you. Now, that's a challenge because a lot of times we get emphasized. We know a lot about the we. We want togetherness. We think that's the solution. And we forget about the I. Or we're so focused on the I, we forget about the we. And we, we fall out of one side of the better or the other. But getting in that middle part is really what emotional sobriety is all about. Act for self without being selfish. Act for others without being selfless. No, I love that. So what I say is there's no such thing as compromise in a healthy relationship. I don't compromise. I don't. I cooperate with integrity. If you want me to do something I don't want to do, it's better for me to say, you know, Alina, I can see that's important to you, but right now I'm not I'm not moved to do that for you. I'd like to know more about what makes it so important to you. Maybe I'll change my mind, but my first response is no. So let's explore it together. Let me hear oh. what's going on. Now, if you say something to me that makes me change my mind, so my no becomes a yes, I'm now cooperating with integrity. I'm doing it because I want to, not because you want me to. You see, that that's like you've been married. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that. But you, you see the trap? If I do it for you. Well, that breeds resentment too. Oh my God. Right? Look at where that yeah, goes. That breeds so resentment. I'll do five things for you. Then the next time you ask, you know, you asked me for a lot of things and you, you haven't done this for me and you haven't done that for me. And how, you know, you're selfish. Then I start to put you down because I'm not taking care of myself. Yeah. You're not selfish. You're asking for what you want in a healthy relationship. It's based on us asking each other for what we want, but it's also based on not taking something from the other person if they don't want to give it to you with an open hand. Mm -hmm. So if yeah, I trust say, me, you don't want it if it's not given with an open hand. I don't want it. And I don't, yeah. and I don't want to give if I can't give it with an open hand, yeah. right? That way I stay grounded in what I want. Not what I should do, not what's the right thing to do, not what convention tells you or what sacrifice means in a relationship. I don't buy that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think when people start throwing themselves away, they're creating a lot of trouble. They really are because it's not really authentic. That's right. Well, and, and you were talking about balance and balance is about acknowledging the boundaries. And I it's, you know, balance is not a razor's edge. It's a path. And it's funny, like as we grow and change, I feel like the boundaries fluctuate a little bit. Like sometimes I don't know where the boundary is until I cross it. And it changes because as I change, I'm either more, and it could be from day to day too. Cause as I, you know, from day to day, there might be days where I feel more generous or some days where I might need more self-care and I don't have it to give. And so it's just, you know, all this is real fluid. And I had a friend tell me, it depends. Like it just, all these things, it depends. It depends on the situation and a lot of things. So that's why, I, that's another reason why we need each other and we don't do it on our own. No, but I love what you're saying. See, that's allowing yourself to be who you are at any given moment. Right. Instead of coming in with an expectation that I should be like this. Mm -hmm. See, as soon as I apply some of these unconscious rules about how I should be, I'm no longer flexible. Now I must be this way to be okay. My behavior becomes very stereotyped. So if I say I have to be a nice guy for you to like me, then guess what? If I have a, if I'm crabby one day, I can't let you see that. I have to hide it. So I become phony, right? I become phony. 
I want to be crabby. I don't feel very good, but now I'm going to, I'm going to not let you see that. So then I might be passive aggressive. Oh, I'll say I'll do it. But then later on in the day, screw her. I'm not going to bring, I'm not going to bring home that milk. She asked me to get milk. I'm not bringing it home today. <laughs> now that may be unconscious on my part, being passive aggressive because I'm too nice to be making her pay for, for asking <laughs> for me. Being to, overtly uh, aggressive. I know, for, for telling me what she wants. Yeah. See, it's crazy the dance we do. I know. <laughs> what you were saying is so true it, from a psychologist's point of view, the way Fritz Perls, and he was the founder of Gestalt Therapy, said it. He says, when you are letting the situation you're in control you and you find the best response to that situation, your choice, once again, to respond in the best way, then you start to grow up mm -hmm. because you're not coming in and demanding that the situation be what you think it should be. You're learning how to deal with life on life's terms. We hear that in the program all the time. All the time. And that's why I'm saying the fit between psychotherapy and what we're learning in the program, it's hand in glove. Hand in glove. I love that. Um, I want to take a step back a little bit. Um, I'm going to toss out my... Um, my oh, your lightning, lightning round. Because <laughs> this is too good. Um and I want to talk a little bit, and I because I do want to spend the rest of the time kind of talking about some more solutions. But um, I want to talk a little bit, like, how did we get here? How did you get to the rooms and get sober? So you started at 12, dropped out at 16 because partying and drinking was your top priority. What happened to you that you decided that you were going to go get some help? I joined the Marine Corps at 17 as a solution, a geographical solution to my problem. Mm -hmm. I was out of control. Um, and I felt like I had to do something to turn my life around. I thought if I become one of the few, the proud, the Marines, that that would change my life. And it, did. it did, but not in the way I expected it to, right? How many times things come in unexpected directions. When in Marine Corps at 17, Vietnam at 18, now my alcohol problem turns into a problem with drugs other than alcohol. And I became addicted to a lot of different drugs. It wasn't just one, but anything that would give me that freedom that I talked about, that emotional freedom. Came back from Vietnam, in, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a combat Vietnam veteran. Came back from Vietnam in 1971. I was 19 years old. And uh, back in Chicago, that's where I grew up, and I was partying for 30 days real hard with all my friends. I mean, dropping acid, waking up in the morning and having an apple juice and vodka. I mean, party was all night long. Going back to my final duty station was at the Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. So when I'm saying goodbye to my friends at the uh, Chicago O'Hara Airport, they're giving me some joints, some acids to keep the party going when I get to Hawaii. And I've got it all in my pocket, right? I'm in my Marine Corps uniform and I've got all these drugs in my pocket. So I, I get to, to Los Angeles and this is 71. So in 71, there were a lot of hijackings taking place. They didn't have security if you were flying domestic, but not, not like today, right? right There's security right. at the front of the air. But then they had a screening set up before you boarded the plane to go to Hawaii because it was considered an international flight, right? You're going oh, really? over water. Yeah, they treated it the same way. So I see everybody getting checked. And I got these drugs in my pocket and I go, uh Oh, I'm going to get busted. So I partied for 30 days. Remember, I'm not thinking clear at all. I'm panicked. I look around the airport back in 71, you could smoke in the airport and they had these trays with sand in them. Now oh, yeah. I was clear headed. I would have gone in the bathroom and done what? Flush the drugs down the toilet. Nobody's going to see me. I close the stall, empty my pockets and leave. But I'm not thinking clearly. So I go to these ashtrays. I reach into my pocket, pull drugs out, bury them in the sand. <laughs> yeah, you're early. Something's wrong with you, Alan. There was something wrong with me. You're right, Arlene. You, were, you weren't stupid. You were just high. <laughs> well, I was, I, was, I was not functioning well. Well, they watched me. Oh, the shit. LAX police officer saw me doing this. So I go through the line. I think now I'm on my way to Hawaii and, you know, felt bad that I had to give up all these wonderful drugs that was I was going to party with. 
go through the line and and they say, hey, Marine, over here. They pull me in the back room. Hey, I've got all the drugs that I put in the ashtrays on the table. They went and fished them out. And I was in trouble. I thought I was going to be arrested, put in jail in Los Angeles. Well, I start talking to the two guys and they say, one guy asked me questions. He says, look, I see that you got a Vietnam campaign ribbon on and combat. He says, you know, tell me about where you were at in Vietnam. And I start told him where I was. Well, he was an MP. He was military oh police. And he was in the same place as I was at the same time. And he looked at me and he says, you know, I'm going to give you a break. I'm not going to arrest you here, but I am calling your commanding officer and tell him you have a problem. And I go, well, I'm thinking, I'm not sure he did me a favor because that means I'm going to the Marine Corps brig, which is a lot harder than going to a U.S. jail, right? The jail in Los Angeles. So I'm thinking the military police are going to be waiting for me. I'm going to get busted when I get there. I get off the plane. There's no police waiting for me. So I said, all right, well, it means that it took a while for the information to get down. They're going to be waiting for me when I get to the unit that I'm going to check into. They're not there. So I figure, well, it's just a matter of time. And I say that we're experts in harm reduction. I always tried to figure out ways. How can I reduce <laughs> the problems that are going to come from my behavior, right? So I decide to turn myself in to the first sergeant and tell him I need help. Well, I didn't want help. I wanted to get out of the Marine Corps and get back to Chicago because the Marine Corps had a zero tolerance policy for drug use. So I go to top and I say, top, you know, I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm Corporal Berger and I'm here, but I got to tell you, top, I got a problem with drugs. And he says, you got a problem with drugs? I said, yes, top. And he starts shuffling papers around. And I'm thinking, what's he doing? How come he's not calling the police that, you know, the military police to get me a, to take me to the brig so I can get processed out of the Marine Corps? He says, he looks up at me, he goes, Berger, you're one lucky Marine. I go, what do you mean, Tom? He goes, three days ago, the commandant signed into an order that instead of throwing you guys out, we're going to put you in rehab. Three days? Three days before I turned my, I was the third Marine admitted into this program, the third third day of this program's existence amazing so i go over there they have no idea what they're doing it's a brand new program but they knew they didn't know and they turned to the aa community in kailua outside the county or marine corps air station base well they happen to have a lot of young people that were following this way of life and they've on tuesday nights they set up what they called the recovery wrap session now, 71, there was no Narcotics on a, Anonymous on the island of Oahu. None. There were no meetings at all. Only AA on the island of Oahu. Uh, and all the islands. There was no NA in, in Hawaii at that point. So Tuesday nights, we had this recovery rap session. And the first one they had, was they invited this fellow by the name of Tom. And I can use his last name. He's given me permission, McCall, to come out and share with us. So here's about 20 combat vietnam veteran marines in this room over by the golf course they put us off in this building because they didn't want us to infect the rest of the population <laughs> they put us way in the corner of the yeah bay. yeah i'm familiar yeah they're familiar with. so this hippie walks in he's got his hair pulled back in a ponytail he's got wire rim glasses on he's got a hawaiian print shirt his khaki shorts and birkenstocks on and I'm like, what's this guy got to share with us, right? We're just coming from combat. He was probably out carrying signs against the war, protesting it. Well, after five minutes, that changed. I had never experienced a person being that open and honest and authentic in my life. Mm -hmm. See, Tom had what I had always wanted was that emotional freedom. He was free. He was free to be himself. He could talk about his anxiety. He could talk about his insecurities. He could talk about his inadequacies. He could talk about his depression. He could talk about his pain. He could talk about his struggles, his imperfections. I had, I experienced every one of those things. I wasn't going to let you know I felt that. I was afraid if you thought that, you'd think less of me. Well, here's this man sharing these things, and I'm not thinking less of him. I'm respecting him. I'm awed by him. I have this feeling, and I couldn't have said it at that time, Arlena, 
that if I could feel that way in life, I think life could work for me. It was like I wouldn't have to drink or use ever again. If mm -hmm. I could get to the place that he was at, things could be, I could be okay. Went up to him afterwards and I said, how <laughs> did you do that? He says, stick close and I'll show you. And I have. Mm -hmm. He's still my sponsor today after 51 years. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. It is. And he's in a, I mean, he's a very special man. He's done, you know, he ended up being part of the trustees of, of Narcotics Anonymous for four terms, 16 years. He helped NA grow in Russia, in, in the Middle East, in Japan, in Brazil. I mean, it's just his story is worth a book in itself. But the the contribution he made to my life is is beyond description. I mean, he saved my life. He saved my soul. He's opened the door to so many things. And he's been there at every point I've needed him. Like you said, we run into trouble at points and points in my life that I was in big trouble in 2004. Emotionally, I was having a major relapse. And I went over to Hawaii and I did another fourth and fifth step with him. And once again, he was there for me and gave me this compassion and love but also no bullshit. I mean, feedback about what, where I was off and what I needed to do. And, and I followed his direction and propelled me to a whole, a whole different level in my recovery. So that's how it began. That's or a, how that's, I began. <laughs> that's how you began. No, that's, you know, what really struck me about that story is how at first blush, we look so different you know, our circumstances are so different. And I can't, I couldn't help but think, oh my gosh, you're a combat Marine and a hippie walks in. And, you know, in today's terms, we sort of joke around about what a hippie means, but back in the context of Vietnam, um, you were putting your life on the line to protect your country and these ideas. And he was somebody who was campaigning against something that you were putting your life on the line. It kind of makes me think of today, how polarized our society is, but despite the differences and in, in some pretty significant beliefs, you guys shared similar feelings. And that's what I mean. Like the circumstances are different, but the feelings are all the same. And that's the foundation that we typically connect on is that heart level. Yeah. So he was, he was speaking the language of the heart. Right. Yeah. And I think that's what is so often lost on people who don't even try it is they miss out on what it feels like to be in the presence of a community who are really speaking from the heart. You talked about he gave you compassion and love. And those are the tools for transformation in my mind. He he had a, a faith in me that I didn't have in myself. And, and he said that, he says, you know, I saw something in you that you couldn't see in yourself yet. Yeah. And, um, and I'll tell you that that was very important for me at that point in time, because I had lost a lot of hope with myself. I didn't know that my life could possibly be any different than it was. And so when that woke up, I became so excited about recovery. And I started that journey, you know, I, after I had about 60 days clean and sober, they didn't have any counselors, so they invited me to become a counselor. Wow. So now, 60 days? 60 days today oh would be unheard of. But yeah. there wasn't anybody back in 71 yeah. that they could have. So I started to help people, and then I got excited about, you know, being a counselor and helping people. And I decided I want to become a clinical psychologist. So then I, I'm a high school dropout. I went back to school. I took a college class in Hawaii. Because I thought I was stupid. I didn't know I could go back to school. And I realized I wasn't stupid. I just didn't do the reading. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't do the homework. It, yeah. it actually, can I, I could learn if I actually read the text. Now, my reading skills were really poor at that point in time because I didn't exercise that. And I probably done a lot of brain damage with all the drugs. <laughs> all it's amazing but how I, your brain can regenerate, though. Oh, Neuroplasticity. It does, it does do that. The neuroplasticity. Yeah couldn't didn't know that at the time but yeah. then I got turned on to school so here's the three legs of my stool 
I've got recovery. I'm totally excited about recovery of being of value to other people that are still suffering. Yeah. And now learning as much as I can and to become the best, you know, conduit I can to helping people discover the way I like to think about recovery today is discovering new possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and That's the way I talk about it. I like that you refer to it as being the conduit because we can be present, but it's really up to the person that we're speaking to, to do the work. That's like right. they have to, they have to be willing to let go of the things that no longer serve them and receive new ideas that will help them change their identity really. Yeah. Well, that's so, part of and see an, an interesting an approach that I have to, to working with people is we take resistance as an important part of people growing. So it's not that they have to be willing to try it. They have to be willing to explore the resistance. Oh, that's so good. It's, it's a little different. See, it doesn't emphasize the changing as much as it does to being aware of what makes you not want to change. Back to the paradoxical theory of change. If I own that I don't want to change, it becomes possible for me to change. But I've got to say, in no way in the world am I going to try that. I've got to say that. This is nonsense. I think it's a bunch of BS. Are you kidding me? And I've got to own that completely to create a space for something new. Yeah. That's so interesting because I've often thought about recovery resistance. How do we help people overcome recovery resistance? And that could be resistance to daily practice to meditate, resistance to, but I, I love that whole idea of just acknowledging it. We don't have to try to push it or fight it, just acknowledge it, voice it. There is something so powerful about voicing your truth. It does tend to transmute the feeling. That's it. See, that's it. And, there, and that's where the willingness comes in. The willingness is to be what I am, not what I think I should be. <laughs> See, that's that's the whole key here, right? And we're talking about it in a lot of different places. And sometimes it's hard to do that because the pressure is you come in the program, oh, you've got to be open-minded. Well, I don't want to be open-minded. What if I don't want to be? What if I think this is nonsense? Do I get to say it? Well, if I don't say Absolutely. it, what's it going to do? It's going to sabotage my, I'm going to sabotage my experience. Yeah. I have many times been at a meeting and I get called on to share or something. And I'm like, I didn't want to come today. I don't feel like talking today, but here I am. Yep. There it is. See, that's great that you can own that. See, yeah. because that shows people you don't have to be someone you're not to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love, I love the, uh, I love the ugly truth. It's what, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. I love the ugly truth. Okay. So much to talk about. So we only have a couple of minutes because I know you have another thing to go to. So if we were going to break down your latest book, 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety, you're, you're just going to have to get the book. I, I mean, my my listeners are big readers. We, we love we love books. I'll speak for all of us. I love books. I'm obsessed. But um, if you had to pick out maybe a couple of, of the essential insights, do you have some favorites? And it's probably asking you to pick a favorite child. Well, I, I do have a few favorites. I mean, my first one is, is this, you know, which is the first insight, is that we, we need to, to realize that we're asleep. Yes. That we need to own that we're operating from a trance. Yeah. And that, that before we can develop a practice of emotional sobriety, we have to really see how we've allowed ourselves to become hypnotized and that we've bought a lot of these ideas about who we're supposed to be. And, you know, what I say is that very early in life is that instead of, of being focused on becoming who we are, we dedicate our lives to actualizing a concept of who we should be. And that's where our trouble really started well before we picked up a drink. That's what makes our life unmanageable, by the way. Because when you, when I disconnected myself from who I really am, there's no foundation for my life. Now my life is based on these ideas of who I should be rather than who I am. And so there's this split. I've abandoned myself. And how can my life work when I have thrown myself away to be what I think I should be? 
that's a big problem. I mean, a huge problem. And I saw the effects of that later on. So that's where the second half of that first step comes in. We admitted we were powerless and our lives had become unmanageable because as soon as I do something like that, now I'm trying to control you by presenting this idealized self to you so you like me, so you love me, so you accept me, so I belong. So now my whole life is about control and manipulation. You've got to do what I want you to do for me to feel okay. My belief is that if, if I can control my environment to be what I want it to be, I'll live a wonderful life. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. I've tried that. That's the insanity, right? Insanity, not meaning I'm crazy, but it's not soundness of thinking. That's right. what we mean when we say insanity. It's just that it's not sound thinking. But but look, we've got to do this again. Let's do it again because there's so much more to say. Oh my God, so much more. We didn't even talk about the podcast that I you know, guys do. We've got all, so we'll set up another time. We'll call you want this- to? Oh, I'm so happy. I was just thinking, oh, how am I going to get... How yeah, do I get Alan in my life? Yeah. <laughs> I need, I well, need more Alan in my life. I'll send you an email and then we'll figure out another time. So, well, we'll uh, stay tuned, do, listeners, do for part two. Right? Yes. <laughs> but get the book. Um, if people want to reach out to you, where can they find you? The best to go send me an email or go to my website. My website's very simple. I use my initials, A B Alan Berger. So, abphd.com is my website. Or you can, my email is abphd at msn.com. Easy peasy. Yes, easy peasy. If you need some help, reach out to Alan. Well, thank you so much for your time today. That was so insightful. We have a lot more to discuss. I'll look forward to part two. And I'll send you all the links about the, uh, (laughs) come and join us on Thursday nights. It would be wonderful. I would love to. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.